We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Paul Hoffman from ICANN. I'm going to be the online moderator for this session. Um, welcome to everyone here. Um, this is a 90-minute session, and the way that we uh, will be organizing is we have uh, three expert speakers, uh, each of whom has um, positions that they will they will lead first. Then we will be having an open discussion, uh, certainly among the speakers, but also hopefully with questions from the audience. Um, for those of you on Zoom, you can use the raising hand feature. Uh, David Huberman from ICANN will be sort of uh, watching the Slack and uh, I'm sorry, watching the Zoom and such like that. Um, but the idea today is that we will be presenting information about DNS privacy, especially how it is happening these days, we will have a bit of discussion, but really our purpose here is to have the community understand better what are the aspects of DNS privacy that are going to affect, that are, are currently affecting um, policy um, and governance, but certainly will be affecting policy and governance uh, in the near future. So with that, I'm not going to introduce the individual speakers. I'll let them do it, but I will give their names. First up will be Andrew Campling. Uh, next up will be Carlos Mar Martinez. And third will be Roxana Radu. Um, and I think it's best if everyone gets to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about not only their background, um, but also where they're coming from on this topic. Uh, so with that, why don't we start? Andrew, why don't you uh, take it away? Great, thanks, uh, Paul, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, as Paul said, my, my name is Andrew Campling. Um, uh, my, my background uh, uh, is uh, in sort of telecoms um, and tech, um, and for my sins, I also do th sort of things occasionally, like uh, sort of dip into uh, the ITF um, and, and other tech fora, uh, as, as well as also more on the public policy, um, public affairs side. Um, so let me just share my screen uh, if I can and I hope this will work well so I trust uh, that you can all see that yes we can fantastic um, I'll be stuck otherwise um okay so um as Paul said we're talking about uh, the state of DNS privacy technologies uh, I, I'm gonna sort of start um with a focus uh, more at the sort of the uh, sort of the client and, the, and protocol end um and, and then we'll sort of move outwards um from from there um uh, Firstly, just a reminder: DNS uh, is the it is the sort of the directory that whether when you type in a URL um, or your client software, so you puts in a URL. Um, sort of DNS provides the IP address, the location of the of the content that you're actually seeking. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how um, developments, uh, recent developments, uh, are going to be encrypted. Uh, look at some other um, sort of things that are coming up uh, uh, in the future, um, uh, as well as just pose a couple of questions um, around uh, technology and whether that can give the necessary privacy um, and uh, consider a few other aspects. I, I will focus a little on the tech uh, aspects, but I will try and keep it uh, also to tease out some of the policy implications of that. Um, and I'll be happy. I'll put some links in the slides. So if, if we're sharing slides afterwards, or anyone wants to reach out to me, you're welcome to have those if they're useful. Uh, so, firstly, and, and very briefly, um, uh, just a reminder that standard DNS. If you look at the top left uh, sort of picture um, on, on the slide, uh, you send a request from a, a device. 
it goes to a uh, resolver which, which converts a URL um, into the IP address and sends it back again to your device. Um, and when sort of DNS was invented um, uh, all those uh, decades ago, um, it wasn't encrypted, it was sent in clear text because that wasn't really um, an issue at the time. Um, and it's worth noting that because it's in clear text, then a third party could, if they had the necessary competence, could uh, either uh, at least passively monitor um, and learn uh, by, by mo that passive monitoring what uh, data you are accessing. Um, or equally, they could uh, they could intercept and maybe change um, the, uh, uh, the 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 results of your DNS queries, um, either perhaps blocking access to sensitive material if it's a say state uh, actor, um, or uh, substituting it with something else if perhaps there are a malicious actor um, that's trying to get you to uh, upload their their malware. Um, so, uh, with that in mind, um, a, a, a number of different protocols have been developed that can encrypt the uh, sort of DNS uh, uh, signal. Um, one of the more, more recent of those, and um, that's had a relatively large amount of uh, uh, interest from the community, is something called uh, DNS over HTTPS, uh, or usually abbreviated to uh, DOE. Um, and if you look at the bottom right picture, you'll see that uh, in this example, very simplistically, it works in broadly the same way. A query goes from your device um, um, to a server and back again. But the main difference is uh, that it's not sent in clear text. It's encrypted and sent within the uh, rest of your HTTPS traffic um, and then decrypted at the far end by the resolver before the result is sent back again um, uh, in encrypted. So um, an observer therefore um, would find it quite challenging, um, uh, if not impossible to actually um, monitor uh, passively or actively what, uh, what you were doing um, through that route. Um, uh, it, it is worth bearing in mind, of course, uh, throws up a couple of considerations from a policy point of view um, that uh, any client software uh, can directly access the DNS this way. Um, and that means they can potentially bypass um, any settings that either the user or the operating system has set any preferences. Um, so it may actually be going to resolve uh, the, that's one that maybe the, the user would prefer not to be uh, uh, using. Um, it's also worth bearing all the, the, in mind that although um, the signal is encrypted, um, the resolver at the far end uh, is decrypting it. So they still see um, sort of details of everything that, that you're accessing. Uh, so so it, it's by no means foolproof. Um, it, it may just removes the risk of, of, a, of um, a, a so-called man in the middle attack. Um, um, uh, an intermediary uh, intercepting and either monitoring or disrupting uh, your DNS activity. Uh, now, in order for you to um, upgrade from sort of standard classic DNS to uh, encrypted DNS, uh, that that means that, that that either the user or the client software has to change uh, the the resolver. I'm just going to briefly touch on a couple of uh, or three different approaches uh, to that. Um, firstly, uh, uh, Mozilla Corporation uh, was, I think, one of the earliest adopters of uh, DOE um, uh, as a standard within the Firefox uh, resolver, um, and it uses approach uh, an approach where it. it Certainly in the US, it will prompt the user to upgrade. It doesn't do it without their confirmation by pressing, if you're looking at the screen, the, the attractive looking OK Got It button um, uh, to move from their existing resolver to uh, 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 an encrypted resolver. Um, but it is clearly encouraging the user to, to, to make that choice. Um, does throw up a number of issues. It, 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 as you'll see, the dialogue suggests that this will be more secure um, and, and improve the user's privacy. Um, it doesn't consider whether the user may already be using an encrypted uh, resolver. 
um, and nor does it uh, uh, take into account whether that uh, resolver does things like malware filtering, because some of the default resolver options that uh, Mozilla offers do not offer um, any, any form of, of uh, uh, protection in that sense. So it's possible by, by clicking that attractive blue button, the user might actually be less secure and have less privacy than maybe they did before because they may be more open to malware attacks. Um, uh, so it does throw up some interesting policy choice uh, sort of challenges uh, that, that way by maybe overriding some of those local choices. Uh, uh, currently, Chrome uh, and Windows 10 uh, are using a so-called same provider auto upgrade approach where they examine the preferred resolver that a user or system has, and then check whether that same resolver operator provides an encrypted option. And if so, they will seamlessly in the background uh, upgrade to the encrypted option. Um, uh, the, the thinking being that, that if it's the same operator, then they should carry forward the same uh, policies in terms of things like, you know, do they offer filtering, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, same privacy uh, sort of choices and so on. So it will maybe uh, overcome some of the issues with the Mozilla uh, approach. But it does require the client software to, to maintain a manually curated list of um, uh, uh, of resolvers um, sort of within the software. It's not automatic um, how it does. Um, and as a technical point, for those of you that are interested uh, in that aspect, um, the resolvers have to be operating from public IP addresses, um, which means that a lot of uh, resolvers operated by ISPs, um, particularly those um, certainly in Europe, I think parts of Asia, uh, I think less so in, in, in the US, um, they, they don't operate on a public IP address, so therefore um, they can't use this route um, um, to, to, to seamlessly provide in background. And that's why, as I move down the slide, this current acti currently activity in the standards body, the ITF, within the ADD working group to look at a standards based approach to finding uh, what resolvers are available that offer sort of different forms of encryption so that client software can use a standards based approach to finding uh, resolvers and then either automatically or through some sort of user dialogue uh, in enabling um, uh, an upgrade and potentially a choice of upgrades uh, that way. Uh, there's there's a bunch of different uh, uh, approaches currently in development uh, with not particularly meaningful names. So uh, DDR, and DNR, or uh, I mean two of those, um, and also it's uh, it, uh, less well developed. But there's currently act activity to try and support a so-called split horizon DNS, which which solves some problems which are particularly pertinent uh, in the enterprise space, whereas the first two um, are maybe more relevant. Uh, in, in the consumer space. Um, there's already some early deployment using uh, uh, DDR. Um, uh, Cisco, Microsoft, and Quad9 uh, have currently got a sort of, a sort of prototype sort of uh, deployment um, uh, uh, using the uh, uh, DDR protocol. Um, uh, DNR is potentially much more suited in the long term to, um, uh, to for the needs of ISPs uh, because it, it works with uh, uh, DNS forwarders um, and private IP addresses, um, uh, so it's far better suited um, to the, the environment that's typical in many markets um, around the world, but may require the CPE to be upgraded. Um, so the adoption cycle will potentially be a lot longer uh, be because of that. Uh, but arguably, that, that's really the best long-term answer. And I think data we had from Google suggests that about 85% of, of queries that, that Google sees originate from a private IP address. So we really need the sort of DNR solution um, for, for the vast majority of, of current uh, resolver tra traffic. Uh, there are some other developments which I'm not going to dwell on um, um, in terms of other encrypted uh, uh, DNS choices. So DNS over quick um, is currently uh, being standardized. It's not quite a standard yet, but it's getting very close to that. 
Um, it's already been deployed as sort of pre-standard. Uh, AdGuard um, claimed the first deployment of both client software and, and a resolver. Um, and from their testing, uh, it appears to offer certainly some performance benefits uh, relative to Doe. Um, but nevertheless, as with Doe, the resolver operator still has full visibility of queries um, from a user. So you still need to invest trust in the resolver operator. Um, to overcome that particular problem, uh, uh, something called Oblivious Doe has been developed, um, which um, through a more complex route is able to hide the IP address of a, a user from a resolver operator, um, but it's by no means foolproof. Um, it really, you, you have to trust that the, 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 the deployment, uh, uh, which goes through a, a series of two proxies, uh, that those two proxies aren't colluding with each other. Because if they are, um, you don't gain any privacy benefit and you do take a performance hit. Um, uh, uh, and uh, so, so that's also uh, in, in development. It, it's unlike to go through to, as a full standard. It's been marked as experimental by the IETF um, because there's greater focus on the development of um, a, a, a broader protocol that, that covers more HTTP traffic than just uh, DNS. Um, and then finally, there's also something called DNA a DOE over Tor, uh, which is much more complex uh, using the Tor network, um, which offers many more privacy benefits, but is a lot slower. So you take a performance hit. Um, but you do need to be careful how you implement it because you might get the performance hit, but still be prone to um, digital fingerprinting. Um, so you may not get the full privacy benefits that, that you expect, uh, even uh, if, if you use Tor um, for, for your DNS queries. Um, and then just briefly covering a couple of other aspects. Um, you may have come across something called Private Relay, uh, Apple's new service, which it uh, announced uh, middle of this year um, and um, went live uh, a couple of months ago with the uh, latest updates to uh, the uh, iOS, iPadOS and macOS um, systems. Um, that encrypts uh, DNS and indeed other traffic using the oblivious um, mechanisms and Apple uh, implementation um, of that, um, which I'm not going to dwell on. There's a diagram uh, on the screen which sort of shows you the sort of two different proxies that it routes traffic to, first of which is operated by Apple, the second of which by one of its partners, um, uh, so that the IP address that hits a uh, resolver um, uh, and indeed that, that hits the website they ultimately visit is is um, uh, is a temporary address, um, not the actual end user's address. So it disguises um, the origin of, of queries. So you get uh, privacy benefits that way. Um, it still suffers from the weakness of oblivious that you um, have to trust that there's not collusion between the proxies, because if there is, you, you don't get um, uh, any privacy gain. They can still observe you if, if they uh, um, uh, collude. Um, and it also throws up um, some issues uh, because of the way it's implemented. Apple's controlling the routing of potentially quite a lot of internet traffic globally um, through uh, private relay. Um, so I know a number of network operators are very concerned about the quality of service uh, and resilience and cost impacts um, that, that it has, um, as well as local policy impacts that, that uh, uh, private uh, relay has. Um, and it also, from a uh, policy perspective, does raise some compliance and antitrust issues, um, which are worthy of consideration if, if time permits. Um, and then also on the horizon, there are some other technical developments, um, uh, sort of the uh, encryption of DNS. So it uh, so removes that from plain text. But there's, this, there's some other data, the so-called server name indicator, uh, which is also in plain text currently. Um, but there's standards work underway to hide that as well. Um, uh, I think 
from a policy point of view, um, the, the issues that that raises are it, it potentially bypasses a lot of content filtering software, so removes protections without warning uh, from end users, uh, and I know that's a concern uh, uh, in some parts. And the way, uh, if you want to reinsert those protections with content filtering, then potentially you have to put far more intrusive software. Um, on client devices than you would currently need to do content filtering. So uh, perversely, um, the, this privacy development um, may result in far more intrusion um, in, in, into data uh, that, that is currently necessary uh, to provide fairly basic protections. Um, and then briefly, the, the other interesting development, um, I know that there's a lot of concerns about increased centralization of uh, internet infrastructure um, and the negative effects that has in terms of monopoly behaviors um, and loss of resilience. The European Commission is looking at a number of initiatives because of that. Um, it, it's certainly concerned about loss of resilience um, within the DNS space and is therefore proposing to introduce something called DNS4 EU, uh, which will provide um, an open resolver um, uh, that, that, it, that the, uh, the European Commission will part fund the uh, deployment costs for. Um, uh, th that's uh, envisaged, uh, I think, uh, you might see the very first deployments of that towards the end of next calendar year. So maybe by IGF 2022, who knows, there might be some signs of the first deployment of that. And that's deliberately intended to provide an EU-based resolver, because many of the current open resolvers are operated by US uh, corporations. Um, now, that's a very brief run through some of the technology developments. Um, and I've highlighted maybe some of the issues that, that they bring. Um, it's, it's worth noting that in most cases, the policy implications of some of the new technology developments are often ignored when the, the technology is being uh, developed. Um, and arguably, um, a lot of those uh, the, the developments um, are brought forward very much with a US market perspective. Um, and it's apparent that there are quite significant differences between different markets. Um, for example, you don't have so, so, so great a prevalence of DNS forwarding from private IP addresses in the US, whereas it's very commonplace in Europe um, and parts of Africa, uh, so parts of Asia, um, uh, at least. Um, and also the, the, the voice of the end user is not really heard um, when a lot of these uh, protocols are being developed. Um, and they, as I mentioned already, do raise centralization and antitrust concerns in, in, in different ways. And it's also worth bearing in mind that they are also that the new developments can be and often are helpful to uh, malware developers. So one of the early adopters of Doe uh, was malware, sadly, um, which is quite predictable, uh, but it's, it's, it is helpful to, um, to malware to, to make it much harder to detect um, on client systems. Um, so with that in mind, uh, in my view, I think more needs to be done to make sure that regulation and legislation uh, keeps pace uh, with uh, sort of technology developments. Um, and also, in addition to looking to technology to solve uh, privacy problems, um, I, I strongly recommend that, that people look to the privacy and transparency policies um, of um, of uh, of the software that they use, uh, the, the companies behind that, because again, a lot of those are often written with a US perspective. Um, and uh, actually there's a word missing on my side, I realized that there isn't, <laughs> not there is, there isn't a US-wide GDPR equivalent, for example. Um, um, so that makes a difference to I think how a lot of the software sort of privacy and transparency policies are drafted. Um, a lot of the policies don't even tell you explicitly what legislation, what, what regulations um, are applicable. Um, they don't necessarily, in some cases, by deliberately, they, they don't state what jurisdiction um, they're operating under, uh, which I think is deeply problematic. Um, if they're operated by US-based companies, and this is certainly true of many of the open resolvers, um, uh, 
even if they do have privacy policies, it's worth noting that the US Cloud Act and FISA 702 uh, apply to all US companies, which basically means that if you're not a US citizen, um, any US law enforcement agency, agency has warrantless access uh, to your private data, which is why I would never use um, a US-based open resolver, um, because it basically, in my, in my opinion, completely overrides any protections from GDPR. Um, and often the policies are, are quite sort of fragmented, quite complex and difficult to understand from, for a typical end user. Um, so I just wanted to perhaps finish off by, by highlighting one of the things that as an industry we've done is to develop something called the European Resolver Policy uh, as an alternative to those by, so, uh, for example, uh, the, those offered by the likes of Mozilla and others, um, with which is explicitly written to be GDPR compliant, which explicitly says that you cannot monetize personal data. Um, either the resolver operator or any third party, um, and explicitly states what jurisdiction um, the uh, service is being operated under, as well as many other aspects. Um, and I would certainly commend people to look at that um, and either look to, to use resolvers that, that uh, are compliant with the European resolver policy or adopt at least um, the, 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 the concepts within it because it's developed openly, it's freely available. So uh, at least take on board um, the, 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 the approach uh, within it. Um, I'll finish there, and, and if anyone does want access to the slides, there's various uh, sources of additional information where I put links and so on, which may also be of interest um, should people want to uh, get in touch. And I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Actually, before we go for questions to you, I think it would be good to, to um, have both Carlos and Roxana um, uh, give their perspectives, uh, just because we do actually have three different perspectives. This is not going to be all technical um, and direct policy things like uh, what Andrew uh, just gave. So, Carlos, um, please introduce yourself and tell us uh, why, give us an introduction to an operator's perspective, if you would. Sure. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you very much. Um, sorry, Bob. <laughs> and thanks, Andrew, for the technical introduction. And I'm going to take it from there. And I, I, I will repeat some of the, from a much higher level, some of the, the, the technical descriptions that Andrew made. And I'm going to address the, uh, what I consider the, to be the, the operator's perspective. One thing that Andrew mentioned uh, in one of his last slides, I think it's very relevant, is that many of these things have been created with a US-centric perspective. I, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. I, I am currently working for LACNIC. LACNIC is the Latin American and uh, Caribbean Internet Address Registry, where we are one of the five RIRs. But before this, I used to work for an uh, ISP, a network operator, uh, the largest in the country, smaller or medium by our country standards about we had like a 1 million broadband customer or something like that um so so the issues and the problems that operators face are very dear to me um let me tell you a bit about south america in terms of uh how privacy in general not only dns is perceived here it's definitely not on the top of the agenda of almost any end user of course, if you present them with a prompt saying, oh, choose this to be more secure, that everybody is going to pick on it because it's nice. It sounds, um, you know, like uh, warm, <laughs> your heart, something like that. Um, but I question how many of those users in our region actually, actually understand what they are uh, choosing to be part of. And there is something that sometimes it's, um, ignored and, and this uh, very large country perspectives tend to ignore is that the operators in countries like uh, say Brazil or Argentina, while there are huge operators there, there are, for example, in Brazil, you have 8,000 small ISPs that cater to very specific communities, rural communities, uh, Amazon communities, uh, many of those using technologies like wireless networking. And for those communities, the operator is sometimes their only contact with uh, the wider internet or 
sometimes even with technology itself. So they depend on them for many things, in particular user support. They configure their computers, they troubleshoot their connections. Uh, they, one could say that they serve a social purpose in that sense. So um, one of the things that worries me is that uh, while I think encrypting DNS is something that we should tackle, uh, it may introduce problems for these particular cases, uh, which I think would be very unfortunate. So um, a little bit more about me. Well, I've been working with a network operator groups in the region for a while. Um, I was part of ICANN CESAC and I'm still doing the root keys, the DNS root key ceremonies, uh, which I hope can be, can take place in person uh, next year again. So uh, I'm not going to go over the details of the encrypted DNS technologies, but the three most relevant, I think everybody needs to have in mind are basically DOT, DOH, and DNS over quick, although there are some new players as Sandra described. Uh, I have my personal favorite, which is DOT, because it's a, it's a proper protocol in terms of the architecture of the internet. It has its own port. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't invent a new transport. <laughs> it's basically using the technologies we have to solve a problem we need. Uh, we know how to solve using traditional technologies. I mean, we've, we've uh, as an engineering community, we've been, we've become very good at um, applying security to older protocols, and we've been doing this in, in I think, a very successful way, like uh, TLS one one, TLS one two, and now TLS one three. So. We have those tools, why don't you use them? So uh, what exactly, and Andrew mentioned this, um, what exactly encrypted DNS protect us from? Basically, it protects us from uh, passive monitoring on the wire or active monitoring in some cases uh, by lawful or unlawful actors. Um, but bear in mind that this refers only to traffic on the wire. In the end, at some point, your query will be in clear text because end servers need to know how to process them. So uh, this means that there are multiple other points where traffic can be analyzed. So encrypting DNS is important, is relevant, but it's definitely not you know, a universal solution to the, to the privacy problems on DNS. Um, so uh, just as one example that I don't remember if Andrew mentioned, I think he didn't, but it's, a, it's a, a, an interesting um, take on the, how information from DNS can leak uh, onwards is that uh, usually when you, you do recursion, you leak a lot of information. And if uh, you are uh, running recursion from a uh, recursive server that, uh, I mean, towards servers that do not support encrypted DNS, you end up uh, potentially leaking more information, like uh, basically asking every server on the internet all the things that you need to know, you want to know. Um, this can be minimized. There is a technical QNA minimization that I actually encourage everyone to deploy. It has its own issues, <laughs> but I think it's also, it's, it's, a, it's just an example of, you know, encrypting DNS is important, but it's definitely not the only thing that, that operators need to do. The other issue that operators find that can, uh, in the particular use cases that I described or situations where, they, where the, the, the operator is an important or has an important role within a community is what I call the shifting trust boundaries. Uh, we've been doing this for a while. I do this myself, right? Like using 888 as a resolver uh, and things like that. Uh, and, and there are very valid uh, situations where that is a good idea. Uh, curiously enough, Many of these small ISPs, they decided to stop running their own recursive and they just they, uh, uh, sent 888 over the HCP to their customers, uh, which um, introduces a set of uh, considerations into you know, um, liability jurisdiction and things like that. Uh, it opens a whole window of, of policy situations uh, for this uh, regulator situation for these uh, operators. So. Um, this, this has been going on for a while and operators, I think they know that many of the, their users do this and they are prepared to deal with it. When I, when I, when I, mention, it, when I, when I mention deal with it, I think what I'm referring to is what happens when a user calls their support line. Basically they're saying my internet doesn't work or even 
worse things like Facebook is down, then the internet must be down or things like that. So uh, they are prepared to ask the proper questions to the users uh, to try to identify this, whether these uh, different uh, DNS resolvers they may be using may be the issue. However, um, when you encrypt this traffic, it becomes much harder to do the same thing because uh, particularly if you use DOH, when uh, where uh, most of the DNS traffic will be mixed with normal web traffic, uh, it can become very difficult for operators to for to troubleshoot potential issues. And there are other things that also can suffer. And one of the things that is most dear to these small operators is the video services they provide. Their local caching for video is very very important for their basically bottom line. Because if users start going, start fetching video content from their transit links, their costs basically skyrocket, and the, and the, the quality um, the, the quality of service they provide to the users definitely suffers. Why does this happen? Because many of these um, uh, encrypted, uh, particularly these um, public resolvers, will not propagate something something called the client ID, which is used for um, a local CDN caching, um, basically preventing uh, local caching from, it, I, from properly assigning a local cache to a user, uh, meaning that your Netflix will suffer or your YouTube will suffer and you end up with a lower quality video and things like that, which translates again into more support calls. So um, one of the things that actually kind of horrified me when Mozilla brought up the first iteration of TRR, which was basically doing it without telling anyone, uh, enabling things by default, was that this would quickly be, could quickly become a nightmare for operators. Um, uh, we even organized a panel in one of the lightning events, one of the, one of the last in-person lightning events, uh, basically addressing this point, trying to raise awareness for within, within the operator community you know, this is may this may happen. You need to be prepared for this. Um, and we tried to reach out to Mozilla, but they, they declined to participate. Uh, so that, that, that was a bit unfortunate. I'm very 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 glad to hear that they some in some form they rolled back this uh, enabling by default uh, policy they had. Uh, on the other hand, Chrome and Microsoft had much uh, I would say friendly uh, approaches to enabling encrypted DNS. Uh, for example something that I'm going to mention on, on, on my last slide, uh, they will try to use an encrypt, a local encrypted DNS provider, uh, basically meaning if your operator provides encrypted DNS, they will prefer that. Um, for the user community, uh, again, I, I agree that the user community is seldom, uh, seldom uh, listened to in these matters. Uh, and this is not a very technical audience and we need to be very clear on the message we send to them. And one of the things that I am very uncomfortable with, I'm uncomfortable with, with is um, when we try to sell solutions that apparently solve everything. Like you know, you will uh, encrypt your DNS and, we, and your privacy will be saved forever. Uh, privacy threats come from multiple fronts, um, and as Andrew described very clearly, in some cases, encrypted DNS can uh, actually take you to a worse position than you were before. Um, there is there is one additional thing that I think it's, I, I'm going to be very clear on, on my feelings on this is, I think it's a terrible idea, which is moving the DNS to the application space. Uh, there, is a, there is a trend uh, of uh, software developers and application providers, particularly from the larger ones, of course, that they think that uh, they can do DNS better than the operating system. So they decide to build their own resolver software within their application. And you end up with, uh, let's say, five or 10 applications on your phone, basically don't, running their own DNS request, perhaps sending their encrypted queries to different recursives, ending up in situations where every, not only not only every user, but every application on a single device could have a different view of the internet, leading to very, very, very uncomfortable, you know, splinter net uh, questioning and bringing the whole centralization debate, uh, I, I would say, sharply into focus. Uh, again, I, I see this is probably one of the most um, 
as a war in trends. This is not specific to encrypt the DNS and this has been going on again for a while. Um, but, I, but I think it's, it will be important to raise, to raise this, this topic, uh, I would say, up more often. So what is the ideal setup for me if I were to go back to working at an network operator? It's basically this, I would enable DOT or DOH, preferably DOT again, uh, on my local resolver. <laughs> and I believe the users should always have the, chance, the, the possibility to use an offsite resolver if they so choose to. Why? Because uh, situations like uh, the one on the lower picture uh, happen all the time and will continue to happen. And I think it's it's a po powerful thing that the users can have tools like offsite resolvers if they need them or they think they can provide better service. Um, uh, and I think I have a few conclusions here. Um, I think, again, uh, I hope I wasn't too, um, <laughs> too strong on my opinions of the OH in general. I think encrypting DNS is important. It's one element on the, pri on the DNS privacy fight. Uh, uh, again, moving, moving trust boundaries without user acknowledgement, I think it's, it was a bad idea. I'm glad to hear that this is no longer the case. Um, and I definitely, definitely encourage operators to deploy encrypted DNS on their own resolvers. And um, right on time, I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Carlos. So it wasn't until about two thirds of the way through your talk that I realized that you were going from slides that you weren't presenting to us. So we didn't. That, is, that was a terrible mistake. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Um, if uh, we'll try to make yeah, those. I, there we go. Sure, yeah. definitely. <laughs> Very that good. Was terrible. Not, not I'm sorry problem. about that. Not a problem. We will um, we will make the slides available later. We'll make sure that there are URLs available and such like that. So sure. thank you. I mean, uh, network operators are obviously very core to all of this. So having an oper, especially having an, uh, the view of point of an operator who's not one of the the giant ones who can do anything, um, very very valuable. So our last speaker for the session, and before we go to general discussion, is Roxana Radu. And I have no idea if I've pronounced your last name correctly, but very good. Um, who will talk a bit about one of the topics that both Andrew and Carlos have touched on, but is very central to a lot of um, uh, policymakers' questions, which are open resolvers and the use of them, how that affects policy and such. So Roxana, please take it away. Thank you very much, Paul. And also thanks to Carlos and Andrew for making my job a lot easier because they have already explained in great detail uh, all the changes that we are seeing in this market. Um, so I'd like to focus uh, a little bit on um, the business model and how that might play out in, in this discussion. Uh, let me start with a quick introduction about myself. Um, I'm a research associate at the Graduate Institute in Geneva, and I'm the co-author of a study on consolidation in the DNS resolution market, um, together with my colleague, uh, Michael Housding from Internet Society Switzerland. We conducted this research uh, last year, and it was published in the Journal of uh, Cyber Policy. And I wanted to touch upon some of the empirical findings from the data that we gathered and also um, some general trends that we think affect the policy discussions. And I do believe the IGF is the right place to have this conversation because it is part of this larger debate as to whether we can have um, security and privacy at the same time. For a really long time, we've been talking about the trade-off, more security for less privacy or the other way around. But this is one of the areas in which we could potentially achieve both, where we wouldn't need to give up on anything. And I think it's a great example of how our thinking has evolved um, throughout the years. And we are now in a position to just have this mature conversation, uh, where, again, the aspiration would be that we don't have to sacrifice anything, that we can achieve both security and privacy um, and a more equitable market, if possible. So uh, we, we know that the DNS resolution is a critical service. It's also sensitive because it reveals data about the websites that we visit. And um, it's integrated in absolutely everything we do online. 
Um, therefore, just not having the security built in from the beginning obviously poses a number of problems, but I think it's um, always good to not have privacy as an afterthought, um, not have it come in at the end. Oh, and potentially privacy as well, but really um, redesign some of the protocols that we have uh, with that in mind. And it's fair to say that the DNS market has been highly decentralized in the beginning. Each internet service provider would operate uh, this service for their local users. Uh, but we have seen an increased concentration of, um, of uh, the power of certain companies in this space because they have offered uh, competitive services that to a, to a large extent uh, provide more security. Um, but also come with some challenges. And we can also talk about these uh, dynamics in the market, like leaving some uh, operators uh, completely, um, un, let's say, uh, yeah, we, we could separate this into two and we could say, okay, there's a, a, a large incentive to invest in this and make it a lot better. And then there's also, uh, that part of, uh, of the market that um, simply thinks, okay, we could outsource the service, it's just going to be better handled by other people, or we simply have no incentive and there's, this is not really a user requirement, there's very little awareness as to hap what happens in this market, so we don't necessarily need to do more, we can just um, go ahead, the business as usual. And that has also meant that uh, the security protocols that Andrew talked about in the beginning tend to be mostly implemented by the large um, open resolvers rather than the small um, ISP providers um, in you know remote neighborhoods um, around the world. So that's where the business model comes in as well. Um, and what we have noted in our research is this consolidation of a two-sided market. There is uh, an aspect that is completely financial to it as well. L a lot of these services uh, are obviously offered for free. So yes, if you pay your ISP provider, in a way you also pay for this service and we all have monthly bills to pay for the internet we're getting at home or at work. Uh, but then if you are using an open resolver, um, you're not necessarily paying anybody directly. And that becomes very interesting because, of course, nothing <laughs> runs for free, right, on the internet. Uh, and here we've noted that there is this two-sided market. So um, the public DNS uh, resolution is offered for free, but there is monetization coming out of uh, monitoring traffic and overall internet health data that can then be sold to cybersecurity companies and basically um, separated as a different uh, package that is offered for um, a cost. And with this, I think we are now in, uh, in a good position to understand that uh, having the market considerations as part of the discussion is, is quite important in order to understand what the regulatory gaps are and to better inform policy, but also just to understand what the consequences might be down the line uh, in the evolution of, of the internet. So on our um, data, we could see that for mobile platforms, more than 50% of all queries were handled by alternative DNS services. Uh, and that was data for 2019. So Google and Cloudflare to, together answered 49.7 uh, of all uh, DNS queries in our measurement, which is based on ONI data, the Open uh, Observatory for Network Interference. We also noted that compared to 2016, where we had less uh, providers in the market, um, just longevity did not make a big difference. This is a highly dynamic market in which Cloudflare and Quad9 could still rank second and third with uh, only a few years of uh, experience in this market. So it's quite interesting to see that um, um, when we talk about consolidation, we will have actually very different uh, implications there, and it might be a market that changes much faster than we, we envisioned. And what we have also noted is that top uh, open uh, DNS uh, providers operate 
mostly from the US, with the exception of Quad9 that also moved to uh, Switzerland recently. But in general, we have uh, we have not really heard a lot in terms of um, of how they are processing data and uh, what that means for for the end users in um, in the policies that we were reading from these providers. Um, so it it goes back to the point made by both uh, Carlos and Andrew about uh, just user awareness, <laughs> number one, and second. Um, privacy protections that might be offered uh, regionally or that might be included in some of the policies which would not be applicable um, for other jurisdictions. Uh, but overall, we noted that there was uh, very limited research in this space and very limited monitoring of market trends. So that puts already policymakers at a disadvantage because um, very few of these providers actually shared any data on it. And there's... Um, let's say, convoluted methodology around how we might uh, monitor these market trends. So my, my colleagues already spoke extensively about the security protocols. I will not go um, deeper into that part, but I think we can ask the question of who gets to configure um, the resolver service. And we have a few options here. Is it users? Well, it's very rarely so. Um, Users still need to be relatively tech savvy to be able to do this, uh, especially if we consider that uh, most DNS requests come from mobile devices and it's not as easy to configure on a mobile device. But more generally so, they have very few incentives to ever look at this invisible part of how they use uh, their devices. Um, it can happen if there is an outage, but other than that, it's uh, quite quite limited. They need to be quite uh, advanced uh, users to, to go there. Second, should it uh, be configured by applications? Carlos gave uh, a wonderful uh, overview of uh, some of the challenges there and some of the um, concerns that it might lead to fragmentation. And then we also have the question of uh, operators co configuring. And uh, here, what we note is that we have different restrictions and obligations in place than we would have with browsers and applications. And then we would have with uh, um, local ISPs versus global uh, operators. And again, security versus privacy. In terms of security, we have a number of obligations on operators themselves. And under the EU NIS directive, we're seeing that. Um, there is a requirement for national authorities to supervise the security of uh, operators of essential services. Uh, but obviously, if um, DNS um, uh, services are provided by telecom, um, we might have we, telecom providers, then we might have them covered by national telecom legislation. And in some cases, they might actually be covered by both. None of these uh, uh, obligations would apply to um, uh, to uh, applications, so that creates already another gap in, in the regulatory space uh, we are talking about. Um, so when we go to just privacy considerations, I think there are three main um, points we can consider. Uh, one is the question of jurisdiction. Again, we don't necessarily know what happens to the personal data collected. Uh, when that happens outside of, um, of the EU, where we have a strong uh, regulatory framework around it, but also many other countries around the world are still grappling with developing their um, personal data protection uh, legislation. So in most places around the world, this would uh, definitely be under explored by regulators. And uh, when we go to the question of uh, how this personal data might be used, and this is point number two, is the question of reusing personal data. Again, we have very little information as to uh, whether this is integrated into other services that uh, open resolvers are offering or even uh, local ISPs. In some countries, there is uh, legislation in place that limits what you can do with this uh, personal data, which again includes domain names, websites you visited, and much can be inferred from, um, from knowing this about a person. So it can be highly sensitive data. 
Uh, but again, we don't know uh, whether there are restrictions in place as to how this might be used. From our study, we looked at uh, the Google policy because they were the dominant player in the market uh, that we investigated. And there we saw that there was nothing in their um, uh, policies to um, restrict integration across their own services. So they might not be doing anything with the personal data as such that would necessarily infringe on uh, the privacy, but uh, integrating that into other services they're offering would consolidate their position in the market, making them impossible to compete with down the line. And the third consideration that I believe didn't come out so far in the discussion, but is quite important, is the question of um, uh, content filtering and um, potentially national blocking. Uh, obviously, national regulators can mandate content blocking in their jurisdiction, and uh, local ISPs would be forced to comply with such policies. And again, this could be for better purposes or for worse. That's a separate discussion we could have, whether that's uh, in order to restrict um, uh, political positions or to um, uh, make sure that um, certain activities are simply banned under national legislation, could be gambling, could be uh, um, any other decision at the national level that has to do with uh, with blocking and that would mandate uh, ISPs to comply with uh, with these requirements. But uh, what we're seeing is that um, the open resolvers are not bound by the same regulations, and that can have uh, an effect on privacy down the line. So I think it's important to, to consider all of this and also keep in mind the business model and whether we can achieve, uh, again, <laughs> privacy, security and an equitable market with an open competition in this space. Thank you. I'll stop here for the time being. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roxana. Um, so we've had three um, different perspectives. Um, not just oh three different opinions on the same topic, but different perspectives um, where people are coming from and such. Uh, for those of you who are not following the chat on on Zoom, there is a fairly active discussion with uh, some different perspectives going on. Um, I think at this point it would be good if folks wanted to um, in Zoom wanted to raise their hand bring some of the uh, discussion that's been happening over in the chat out so that our speakers and so others in the virtual room, I'm looking over at the upper left corner of my screen at the actual room, which seems to be nearly empty, unfortunately, as you can tell, none of the speakers are um, in the face-to-face -face meeting in Poland. But if folks would like to bring some of the perspectives that they've been um, uh, stating over in the chat out to the room, that would be great. Certainly our speakers can also speak to them even if uh, folks in the discussion are not, um, since I can see that some of our speakers have been following the chat as well. But anytime you talk about the balance of uh, privacy, especially via encryption and policy, um, it brings out some strong opinions, which is just fine. Um, as folks know that my background is actually on the technical side, um, but as a strong advocate of the technologies that we've been talking about, um, at least from their technical implementation, which is why I, you know, helped to develop them in the standards body. But really, this kind of discussion should be among people who um, are both implementing the technologies and distributing the technologies, as well as the ones who are governing them. So. Um, I encourage folks to raise their hand. I will call on you and um, I'm not even sure how to unmute. Uh, maybe David Huberman will help me on this um, if folks want to speak. But if not, I still would encourage the, um, the panelists to, to speak to each other for, about what they are seeing and um, the conversation can continue. We still have half an hour. I think there's plenty of time for us to uh, hear a lot here. So. Um, I'm not seeing any hands raised in the official Zoom thing, but I think I saw Andrew. Did you put your hand up? And if so, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah in fact, I, um, I was going to ask how anyone actually in the room in Katowice can, can uh, engage. I presume there's a microphone in the room, and it looks like there's a lady walking hey. to it. So, Can you hear me, though? 
Yeah. Oh, oh hey. 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 Very good. Thank you very much. Yes. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Mallory Nodal here from Center for ah. Democracy and Technology. Um, Bring, Mallory, thank you for thank you for holding the space for us. There. Absolutely. I'm not going to moderate. I actually don't have a comment, but maybe <laughs> others then feel encouraged to come to the mic. Um, I also, like Paul, agree um, that working on the technical side means we do need to have these conversations in this space that brings in the policy. And I think that what I'm hearing just also from the last, from Roxana's presentation, is that it might make sense to to bring some real policy recommendations around this, where as we can meet in the middle on the other side of things, I've worked with um, Siobhan Call from uh, at Brave, Soft Brave Software Now. We worked on a, on a policy paper, well actually it's a technical paper that brings um, in the public interest on DNS privacy. So that paper is trying to resolve, you know, what from a user perspective is the right technical choice um, across various tensions. So it disrupts measurement, it disrupts accessibility features, um, it can disrupt a variety of things, and I think some of those have been mentioned here today, but we're trying to approach it from like, what's the best in the public interest so that we don't have big telecom operators speaking in the public interest, because that seems to be an incongruous um, spokespersonship. So, um, what would be really useful then is, yeah, like I said, to meet us in the middle then with real concrete um, changes to policy that would encourage the right um, user-centric approach um, because it is an ecosystem question, right? Like we're not necessarily going to be able to control um, how implementers do this. Um, we can only suggest what's best when folks are really trying to do the right thing for privacy, how they can do that um, to get the best trade-offs um, and what users actually want, given that it is, you know, it's like a rather difficult thing to know how to configure and to know how to threat model. Um, so that would just be my, you know, encouragement. Maybe Roxana, you and I can talk later and I can also share that paper that I'm refer referencing if it's at all interesting. Um, it's not final because there's so many other considerations that continue to come up that we want to, um, keep feeding into it. So, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I would be very curious as to your preliminary conclusions, what would be uh, best in the public interest? Well, it's very complicated. I think somebody mentioned before, like we can't actually have silver bullet solutions and we never try to, but being able to trouble the questions from a variety of different angles is what's important. And to also evaluate the difference between Doe, Dot, um, oblivious DNS, all those different things have different outcomes depending on what problem you're actually trying to solve. So it's more just like a very complicated guidance um, for implementers, which is, I think, the best we can do. Thank you, sure. I'd love to follow up. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not seeing any hands in the Zoom room, so I'm going to, uh, I, I, I try not to speak for other people, but I will, um, I, I want to, to surface one of the things that was said a few minutes ago in the chat, which was that um, the, the feeling that, um, or the question of, should we not have deployed these technical solutions before the policy discussion had happened? Um, and um, so basically, do you have a policy discussion on privacy um, in the absence of knowing how the technology will work? Or do you deploy the technology as a way of getting the, uh, the policy folks to understand what will happen under certain circumstances and such like that? So uh, I think that that's a, a fairly relevant point. And clearly, I'm of the opinion that the privacy should be uh, um, uh, the privacy technologies should be deployed early and often um, as a way because, you know, for in in areas other than DNS over the last 25 years, we have seen policy follow deployment by five or 10 years. And those are those are it. My feeling is that in those five or 10 years, um, we wouldn't have seen any policy discussion unless it was forced. So um, it's not that I believe that we need to force policy discussions all the time, but in these cases, I think history shows that we did need to, in fact, deploy first. So um, I see somebody else in the room, and even though we, you know, the vast majority of us are offline, I, 
I like face-to-face -face stuff. So whoever's at the mic, please speak first. And then we have some other folks with hands up. Great, thanks. My name is Colin Curry, and I'm joining from Ofcom, which is the communications regulator in the UK. One of the things that we're uh, really proud about in the UK regulatory space uh, is the development of a new kind of umbrella organization called the Digital Regulators Cooperation Forum, which brings together Ofcom, the Information Commissioner's Office, and the Com Competition and Markets Authority to try to set kind of common agendas uh, around the evolving regulatory space for digital uh, platforms and services. So I wondered, I know that Andrew had spoke, uh, had mentioned in passing um, competition, kind of that, that angle of things. I wondered if the different panelists would be able to comment a little bit more about that intersection. And just to respond to your point about um, the kind of policy and technical questions, I think it's really important to, to treat those hand in glove. And, uh, you know, as regulators in, in the UK, at least, uh, there's been a really concerted effort to bring more technologists on board and to try to um, beef out internal capacity. But obviously, there's a real need for kind of ongoing multi-stakeholder and, um, and relationship building between different actors to ensure that policymaking isn't happening in a vacuum. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, Andrew, you have your hand up, but also I think since you were just name called here, why don't you uh, respond to that? Sure. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll sort of do this in order. So, so firstly, the, the reason why I, uh, I raised my hand was to the, to the earlier point about um, uh, needing to also have the policy discussion as well as the tech development. Uh, in my view, I think one of the current problems uh, that, that we have is the standards bodies are operating in a vacuum, um, not deliberately, uh, in, in fairness, but there's way too little uh, engagement from the rest of the multi-stakeholder community in standards development, even though the development of those standards uh, often brings with it enormous uh, policy and other impacts. And as I said earlier, uh, in my view, the voice of the end user is really quiet uh, in 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 the standards fora, and I think again that's deeply problematic. So I, um, there are a few honourable exceptions, but I would really love to see more regulators, uh, more government agencies, uh, more industry bodies um, so present in the standards development. Um, and frankly, I, I, th I think current stance within the ITF that that we only focus on the technical aspects and don't look at the policy uh, 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 implications of developments is, a, is an issue that, that needs to be fixed. Um, uh, so so uh, yeah, we, we, that, that, we need to have proper engagement in the standards communities. It's, this stuff is far too important uh, to, to leave it just to the technologists uh, because, you know, dare I say it, the tech sector has done some bad things over the last decade or so no one in their right mind <laughs> would let it carry on by itself um, without paying careful attention to, to, to what it's doing, because um, otherwise it will make bad choices, uh, uh, in, in my view. And I've, as in saying that, so, so, uh, I've completely forgotten. Uh, Colin made a good point. Uh, would you mind prompting me, um, maybe slightly Paul, so I can then get back on track and, and address Colin's point? Um, I well, she was speaking about the uh, competitive aspect, oh, sorry, uh, yes. anti-competitive aspect yeah, yes. of sorry. operators or, you know, folks who are receiving the traffic or blocking others from seeing the traffic and yeah. such. So uh, I, I, I think that's really valid. And that's one of the motivations behind the European Commission bringing forward its DNS for EU uh, project, uh, because there are antitrust concerns. Currently, for example, if, if I looked at to the excellent data that comes from APNIC uh, with Jeff uh, Huston and, and team um, uh, for, from their data, the combined share of traffic that uh, Google's Open Resolver sees, for example, if, it, if you look at both the data that goes directly to it, um, uh, um, uh, including the, the data rooted, as Carlos touched on, from, uh, from ISPs, and also the data that it gets if there's a serve fail from a first choice resolver, potentially it could see up to a third of global DNS traffic in some conditions. But uh, in, I think in normal conditions, it would see about 15% uh, of global traffic, not 
you know, just one country's traffic, but the entire globe's DNS traffic, which given its dominant market position um, in search and digital advertising, if I was a, a, an antitrust regulator, I'd be paying very close attention to that. Um, equally, some of the, 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 you've got to, from an antitrust point of view, consider the business models of some of the other open resolvers, not all of them. Uh, Quad9, for example, is an honorable exception because it's not for profit. Um, some of the others, uh, they're obviously monetizing not necessarily the personal data, but they are monetizing their operation to improve their core business um, and potentially to exclude others. Um, so, uh, yeah, again, you know, the antitrust, you know, if somebody's doing something for free, um, but it has a cost, um, uh, surely a regulator should be considering how are they recovering that, uh, that, that cost? Um, uh, because potentially um, they're, they're disrupting a market um, for a commercial uh, 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 motivation. Um, and probably time doesn't allow here, uh, but uh, certainly Again, I put some links uh, in my slide, so uh, email me for them, and then uh, I put a report out recently, for example, on private relay, where there's some clear um, antitrust uh, considerations, which, if, again, if I was a regulator, I would be having a very close look at. Um, but uh, yeah, time to, probably doesn't allow to, to dwell on that just now, so I'll stop there, because I see Carlos wants to say something. Thank you, Andrew. Carlos, please. Thank you. I, th this is a very, very interesting discussion. Uh, I, I would like to, to start by uh, re referring to something that I think uh, her name is Colleen from Ofcom. Uh, she mentioned something about an initiative uh, bringing together operators in order to collaborate. And I think that's a brilliant idea. I actually have tried to raise the same idea with the regulator here in Uruguay. So I would love to, to get in touch with you, Colleen, uh, to see whether you can uh, help me with some ideas to, to actually convince the regulator here to, to, to make something like that happen in, in my country. Uh, I think, uh, and uh, taking from there, I think one of the key things that I believe was lost in the whole debate on whether DOH was good or not, was that no technology happens in a sustainable way without industry collaboration. And this opened a few things like, uh, I, I don't know how involved were the, the developers of DNS, open source DNS uh, software um, solutions like, you know, Bind, Not, um, Unbound and things like that. Uh, because in my opinion, those are key players in this. Uh, having good open source implementations of encrypted DNS resolvers is actually one of the most powerful tools we can use to actually get encrypted DNS deployed uh, widely. Um, I know that they, I don't know if all of them, uh, but most of them now have implementations at least of uh, DOT, I'm not, not so sure about DOH, uh, but that took a while. For a long time, the only way of using uh, DOH uh, was using you know, something on the internet. I don't want to pick on anyone because particularly Cloudflare has been very open in, in our region. Uh, we have very fruitful discussions. They agree to participate in events and talk about uh, th these issues. And um, I definitely have a very good relationship with them. Um, uh, talking about industry collaboration and, and um, reinforcing something that Andrew said that I think is very, very, very concerning is that operators participation, for example, IDF is probably at a, at a record low at this time. Basically, there's next to no engagement with the operator community in the ATF. Yeah, sure, some, you may find, you know, some emails from, uh, you know, I don't know, VT.com or at and or something like that in the registrants, uh, in the registered participant list, but it's the, there is no meaningful interaction with the operator community from the ATF. And, uh, uh, sadly, from what Andrew said, I, I get the impression that it's also the uh, situation in other standards, in standards bodies. And I think that's very unfortunate. Uh, it, in a way, it also happens in our region, for example, in the uh, Network Operators Group. Curiously enough, they're called Network Operators Group, but most of the participants there are either from smaller networks or uh, universities, uh, which is great. But I mean, we are... There is, there, is, there is a disconnect there, and it's probably, I think, this, this two manifestations of the same phenomena that I think we should address. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carlos. Uh, 
Roxana, just before you jump in, I, I would like to respond to the uh, the feeling that not enough um, uh, either operators or regulators and such are active in the IETF. Um, that has always been true. Uh, it has been more and less true at various times, like Carlos mentioned. Um, voluntary organizations, uh, especially voluntary organizations that um, spend a lot of time on developing new ideas, it's very hard to get people whose day job is to look at current developments, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to, to be involved. Um, if, if we can get more folks who will be affected by our protocol changes involved early, that's great. Um, so Carlos, you were asking, for example, um, you know, how many, how many developers were involved in like DOT and DOH. And there was a good smattering, but even they were looking at it as, what am I going to have to do once this uh, protocol is finished? And are they doing anything in the protocol that would make my development difficult? Similarly, when we do get uh, folks from the governance community in the IETF, they are often only watching and would only speak when um, a development is obviously going to hurt them in the short run. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not suggesting a way to get them more involved. I've certainly been active in trying to get newcomers to the IETF, you know, over a long period of time. And that is sometimes successful and sometimes not. Um, but all organizations that are voluntary generally have a hard time at getting um, uh, participants to be active early in the process. And the IETF, you know, having been around for over 30 years, has seen this over and over again, not just in the DNS and not even just in encryption. Certainly there's other things that we do, but let's stay on the DNS topic without diverting back into routing and routing security and such like that. Roxana? Yeah, thank you. Just two brief comments. One is that we definitely need to look at the ecosystem and we can't regulate uh, in silos. That is simply not going to work. We've seen this happening for more than a decade now, and I think that has to change. So I commend uh, the, the initiative from, from the UK for trying to bring everybody in the same room and understanding this collectively. And I think the EU is moving in um, in the same direction. We've been part of consultations uh, on the resilience of uh, DNS and so on. So I think that's getting quite a bit of attention uh, recently. And that's a good uh, shift from, um, from a policy perspective. We definitely need to make this invisible part of how our networks operate more visible also to the end user because at the end of the day uh, we are never getting informed if our uh, ISP provider is switching to an open resolver we get no notification it's not part of the contract so to be able to challenge this even at the level of um, you know consumer protection it's um, it's a completely different discussion but it has to be um, the ecosystem approach that we're taking rather than um, just talking to um, the open resolvers or just talking to ISPs and so on. And we definitely need to integrate the, um, the consumer perspective here. I would prefer if it was more of a user protection safeguards approach rather than just protecting what you consume. But uh, whatever goes in that direction is still uh, welcome. And second, um, I would like to also touch upon the dynamics in the standards community. And I'm not as experienced as Andrew is, but I think it's fair to say that some of the proposals uh, that we are seeing now getting implemented on a large scale are uh, sponsored by the open resolvers. So it's Google putting forward some of these proposals. And even, and of course that doesn't, ever challenge the business model, right? So these are small adjustments. It never goes into a complete overhaul of uh, what we currently have that would actually make them get access to less data. So by not having those other voices in the community, we are ending up with uh, the voice of the loudest, the ones that are always present. And that is, again, not going to mean a fundamental change for public interest. And second, that with, with voluntary 
Standards, obviously, there's a question of implementation and adopting the standards. And if uh, we are having uh, operators with so much power in the market, they can always design their own standards, right? So the fact that we have global discussions about certain um, um, standards that could improve everybody's well-being doesn't mean uh, everybody is going to adhere to that. And we are seeing that uh, with the power of just switching to another alternative because we just have that option out there. Um, so consider um, a market uh, of this type in five years time where there's even more consolidation. I think that brings us to, uh, to rethink some of these connections between what uh, these actors do with the market power they have and how that plays out also in the standards making bodies. Thank you. Thank you, Roxana. And, and just to acknowledge what you just said about um, uh, the powerful players already who are using their, you know, who, who can set their own internal standards. Uh, the DOH standard uh, was something that Google already had implemented internally. And um, when the IETF said we would like this as a public standard, and that was mostly, even though I was co-author on that, that was mostly driven by, by folks at Firefox. Um, Google was perfectly okay with that. So uh, one of the nice things about open standard bodies is that if there is a first mover, sometimes they are, are doing first moves just to get things going, particularly on the privacy side, and um, are willing to then also take in uh, the input from other folks. And in this case, in, in the DOH case, um, they've, they've done that pretty much uh, fairly heavily. So I think what we're seeing in, you know, open standards as well as open governance, such as meetings like this, is that somebody needs to get the discussion started. And maybe that's not just with words, but with an activity. Um, as long as they're willing to then say, okay, now the discussion started, what do we need to do? Um, I, th I think is, is something that we at least see in the technical side. I would love to see it also on the governance side. Mm -hmm. um, I see someone at the mic. Um, it's sort of funny being not in the room, but please go ahead. Thanks, um, Mallory, again. So I want to just be clear about um, what the goals are. And so when, I, when we wrote the paper I mentioned before, it was about DNS privacy generally, not specifically any implementation of it. Just the very notion that our lookups should be private is good for privacy, obviously. It's also really good for um, censorship circumvention. So that's a right to information issue. Um, it's a freedom of expression issue. There's actually a lot of really good reasons for it. And it would be inevitable that um, users would want it, that um, there would be operators that would want to provide it. And so the details of how it was done, um, I also don't think would be well influenced by um, governments or regulators that had an agenda coming to the standards bodies. Um, how it was implemented with, with DOE, with DOT, with all the other options out there, um, it's just the best way to do it from an engineering perspective. And I don't think that those changes, any change, you couldn't make changes to these specific protocols in standard setting that would make um, a government body happy or an ISP happy um, because really what we're saying is that we're going to disrupt the ability of intermediaries to look at this data and we're going to let users decide which intermediaries they trust. So that is going to have an impact on um, ISPs who, t who like to filter um, content by domain. Um, it's going to have an effect on um, any kind of censorship that uses the DNS now. And, and so, yeah, there's going to be there's going to be those outcomes, but um, I, I just want to clarify that I don't think um, that this is necessarily about um, who made the standard, um, as has been pointed out. We keep falling back on this thing where it's you know big tech is a euphemism for U.S. companies that are outside um, the purview of GDPR and others. But that's a policy question. That's um, go. Let, let's make some re recommendations for how to do that better. And, and the other side of it on the technical level, how you resolve that 
for example, well, resolve as a an intentional pun, um, but you know, one of the things it, with regards to ISPs who have for many years had um, the corner of the market on DNS data and have abused it. I mean, if you read the um, report that just came out of the FTC in the US about still these persistent abuses of user data by ISPs, which is incredibly staggering, um, that's been the status quo. This changes that. And I will note that to get ISPs back into the game of DNS data, they have to resolve using DOE or DOT, which is ironic, and they will do that, but so we're effectively um, pulling ISPs kicking and screaming into a space where they're actually respecting user privacy, and I think that's actually a good thing, even though there's still some resistance to it, which I don't quite understand, but I'm happy to know there are folks working on getting more ISPs to do that, and I'm glad to hear that there are lots of people on this panel who think that that is the right thing to do, because it is. Thank you. Um... I'm not seeing other hands of new folks, but so please, Andrew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that segues fantastically well in what I was wanting to say. So thank you uh, for, for that, uh, Mary. Um, looking specifically at uh, Doe first, and then perhaps I'll make a more general uh, ob observation. Um, I think is is you've got to consider what the motivations were in the design of Doe specifically. Um, and I note that uh, one of the reasons the browser uh, operators like Doe is because it gives better browser performance. The fact it may also have some privacy benefits is interesting, but I think entirely coincidental. Um, um, it's all about giving a snappier user experience uh, with, with a browser. Um, I, I, one of the reasons I'm concerned about Doe is the design allows for the use of cookies, um, which if, if you were genuinely concerned with um, privacy, you, you, you would not do that. Because um, uh, you're, you're now into the HTTPS realm. Um, uh, so, uh, which is partly why within the European resolver policy, we, we uh, are clear that uh, resolver operators should not support uh, cookies. Um, and also, again, from a privacy point of view, again, a technical point, um, some of the resolver operators, ironically, some of the cloud uh, operators, for again, for performance reasons, have se se uh, session lengths of as long as seven days, which is fantastic for digital fingerprinting, uh, and, and conversely, really bad for privacy. Um, so um, uh, the reason I'm making those points is simply encrypting DNS is not magical. It does not by itself infer privacy. Um, it simply means that uh, no other party can easily get hold of your data other than the, the resolver operator, but they may have bad intentions, which is why, as I said earlier, you must consider basics like what's their privacy and transparency policy, what jurisdiction are they operating under, et cetera. Um, don't just go, oh, it's using Doe, therefore my privacy is protected, that's fine. Uh, the, the reverse um, uh, may, may well be true. Um, uh, and also, just Andrew, to pick up... I'm gonna I'm going to hop in here. Uh, there is actually a physical room, and we're going to get shoved out of it in a few moments. So if I can okay. cut you off, let Carlos have the last word. Um, sure. And then, like I say, it, sitting here in California, I don't think of these things, but but there is a physical room that's going to have to be cleared soon. So thank you. And Carlos, do you want to have the last word? Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to, to highlight something that uh, Mallory said, that I think anything that breaks status quo and brings them to light is a good thing. The problem is that the new status quo needs to be better than the last. So just shifting the party that abuses something to a different party that abuses it in the same way, it's not necessarily improvement. Uh, but I, 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 I definitely agree that bringing these things to light uh, creates a debate and creates a space for improving things. And that's a good thing. And my final, uh, final reflection is that uh, I definitely think that we need to increase traffic. I just need, think we need to frame it in the proper way. Uh, not assign it roles or, or powers that it doesn't have and, and have it in perspective of uh, have wide industry collaboration. And 
Thank you very much. This was a very lively session and very enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, especially thank you to all three of the speakers, uh, Andrew, Roxana, and Carlos. Uh, thank you for the active discussion over in the chat. Um, I guess this is what we get when we're not in the room and stand, all standing at the mic line. And thank you for the folks in the room standing at the mic line. Uh, I do like to be reminded that uh, um, there are physical people and, and when they stand at the mic line, you don't see the back of their office and such like that. So uh, enjoy the rest of the week uh, in, in Poland and um, uh, hope to see you all in the various discussions about DNS privacy um, that are coming soon. Thanks.